our beloved President, Sri Dayamadaji, asks us to convey to all of you who are participating by coming to this convocation or by serving and helping. She sends all her love and her blessings. And she was mentioning that these convocations give us an opportunity for both monastic and lay disciples to spend some time with each other. And in that spending time with each other to help deepen that bond that we all have with each other. Because we are all one large spiritual family. And this is something I have noticed many times in traveling around the world, that you go to a place that you have never been before, you meet the devotees there, but you never feel a sense of strangeness. You always feel that you have just come home again, you are home. And that is because we are all one spiritual family, as Ma said. Wherever we may be scattered over this globe, Remember, one spiritual family, but it's a large family. Guruji ended his autobiography of a yogi by saying, Lord, thou hast given this monk a large family, and it keeps getting larger, and that's nice. So how can we do what the title of this talk says, taking God with you through life? In the deepest sense, God is omnipresent, God is everywhere, so how, in that sense, can we take him with us? Wherever we go, he's there. But on the other hand, it is helpful that we be reminded that though God is everywhere, we are not always everywhere aware of God. And so it is helpful that we do things that remind us of God, that keep that consciousness in our mind. So I feel that what this title means is it means sharing with God, sharing with our guru, our life and our activities. So how do we make that sharing? How do we keep that in our consciousness. In the West, that's called practicing the presence of God, where we do something to continually bring our attention back to God. In the East, that's commonly called Japa Yoga. Again, something by where we are taking a thought, repeating something that always brings our attention back, because it's so easy as we go about our duties and particularly when we are pressed by many duties and things and pressures upon us, it is so easy to get caught up in the outward drama that we forget about keeping the inner connection. I suppose the ultimate of that experience is when we are aware of that divine presence every moment of our existence so that effort is no longer necessary. The effort has already been made and the goal has been achieved, such as the case of our guru. But it is attainable before his exalted state of being has been achieved. It is part of the process in obtaining his exalted state of divine consciousness. So, our guru has shown us the way how to attain that state of higher consciousness. And he has given us the opportunity through the convocations, through his lessons, his talks, his books, his life itself. He has shown us there an example of devotion to God and more than just devotion to God, determination to find God, to connect with God, to bring about that union which the very word yoga implies. So as you leave this convocation to return to your homes, 
Take with you what you have learned while you have been in this convocation. The experiences you have had, the various talks you have heard, the techniques you have hopefully absorbed in a deeper way, the spiritual friendship that has been here, the understanding that devotion is a part of our path and helps us along the path, so that we can put into practice as we go about our everyday duties, those things which will keep our consciousness centered and uplifted so that we don't get so dragged down into the delusion of everyday life that we forget the purpose for which we are here. We did not come here merely to just live and die. There's a purpose to our lives. And you all have been blessed because you have grasped to a greater or lesser degree that purpose and understand that life has a deeper purpose and that we should not forget that purpose but be trying to fulfill it. So you have all of these things. Druji has given us what we need. We are on the path to success in that endeavor. And so it really all comes down now to one thing, and that is perseverance. Larry Mahashai said it delightfully, Bunat Bunat Bunjai, which I have translated, keep on keeping on. Keep after it, never let go. Now one of the big struggles in the spiritual path is trying to find time to make spiritual effort. Life is pretty hectic in this Dvapara Yuga. And often the pace of life is such that we may seem overwhelmed, that we can hardly keep up with it, that it is sweeping by us so fast that it is hard to stay with it and to keep our peace and calmness. This is true not only of householder devotees, this is also true of monastic devotees. You know, just because we're in an ashram doesn't mean the world went off and left us alone. It's right there too. We're also living in this world. And so the, the problem is, or perhaps what we need to think about to take the problem away is we have to learn how to use our time better. It becomes a thing of time management. We don't want to waste too much time. And so we have to plan our lives a little bit. Now all these computers and gadgets that have come about in the last 40 or 50 years, I remember when these were first coming and everyone was saying, oh, people are gonna have so much time they won't know what to do with all their time. Ha, ha, ha. It has been exactly the opposite, hasn't it? All of these so-called time savers have merely laid another burden of time on us because they've sped time up. And everything is demanded quicker. We are expected to produce more faster and whatever it is. So it's been quite the opposite. So to keep our peace in such a hurried up state of existence, I can see exactly why Babaji sent these teachings at this time. We need it in the Stvapra Yoga. So do whatever you can. Many times I know many families, you are working longer hours, perhaps both of you are working and if you have children, that is always a struggle because they require much time to take care of them and there's so many things going on. But to keep from being frazzled, to keep from being worn out, try, try something about planning at least as much of your day so that you can get in some time for spiritual effort. And the way to do this is to try to routinize your life, to develop some kind of a routine in your life. You will find that will help. 
Routine is an interesting word. It comes from the French word root. And that word literally means to break down the bushes and the grasses and the weeds and sweep them out of the way so you have a clear path in which to move. So in other words, it makes it easier for it to happen. Routine makes life easier. And so work on routinizing your life a little bit, planning as much as you can. Once you've done it, don't expect that you're gonna be able to follow it perfectly every day. Every time I have done this, sometimes I couldn't even follow it the very first day. <laughs> Something would come up and you couldn't follow it. You can only do the best you can, but then come back and keep trying to follow it as much as one can. At least, and particularly, try to follow that part where you get some meditation time in. Diamond, I remember her talking many years ago in, in a meeting she had with the devotees in the local area here where we were all called together, a large group of people. And as she was ending this and going out of the hall and greeting people as she was going, she continued to talk because I'm sure she was feeling what the devotees were feeling, that pressure that they felt in their life. And she said to them, can't you at least make enough effort that you give God 20 minutes during each day? And then as she went on, she must have been picking up their thoughts because she said, can't you give God at least 15 minutes every day? Can't you give God at least 10 minutes every day? Can't you give God at least five minutes every day? Even five minutes will make a difference. But try for 20. <laughs> Our beloved Ma said in one of her talks, many people, because of mental restlessness, do not really want to make the effort that is required to meditate. They will rationalize their preference for other forms of inspiration in order to justify that inner, perhaps unconscious, unwillingness. But neither music nor any other source of spiritual stimulation is an adequate substitute for meditation. All art forms can inspire, but nothing can take the place of direct communion with God. And then speaking of this time problem, she said, no one ever said that the Lord was going to make life easy for any of us. It is a constant struggle and always will be. Now, I hope you don't find that too hard, that and always will be. But that is the nature of delusion. That is the nature of creation. Creation by its very nature is always having struggle within it. It's just part of the drama of life. One has to understand that while that is always there, as one continues to meditate and becomes more focused in one's life, and the meditations become deeper, that while the struggles may still be there, your ability to cope with them is growing. And so it does, in that sense, become easier. All of creation is flowing out from God. Most of mankind is flowing with it. The individual, therefore, who has turned his life back toward God is struggling against this mighty current of outward flowing energy. And that is why when we talk about meditation, we say, go within. And sometimes nice devotees ask, what does that mean to go within? Well, as long as we are on the surface of the body, where the senses are operating, we are in the outward flow. We are in creation, where all the noise and all the drama is taking place. When we learn to reverse the searchlight of our attention in meditation and send it inward instead of it flowing outward, then we are, as she was pointing out here, going against the stream. We're going 
back home instead of going out into the play. And so it requires effort to do that. It's like going upstream, it's against going downstream. If you're going downstream, it's very easy. You just hop in the boat and float, right? But remember, at the end of the stream is a fall. <laughs> Big waterfall. So we want to get away from that, then we have to go upstream. So don't let life carry us along like a leaf on that stream unthinkingly. We will be happier in our lives if we use Master's philosophy that he has taught us in all of his writings. And as we practice whatever meditation we are capable of, we will find we will be happier in life and we will be able to do better. Try to, every day, no matter how busy you are, to always take a few minutes every now and then to stop and just refocus on God or on Guru. When I was working at Douglas before I came into the ashram and I found Self-Realization Fellowship and I was beginning to meditate and do other spiritual practices as we are taught, I was trying to do this because if you're working as I was, it often requires all of your attention. So how can you keep God in your mind if your attention is on your work? Your work requires complete attention. So one thing I used to do is I would spread this old big blueprint out on my desk and I would look at a part that I was really concentrated on, and I'd put my hand like this, and I would sort of get down and lean on it so they couldn't see my eyes, right, you see? Anyone come by, it looked like I was really focused on that part of that <laughs> blueprint. But I was looking here, and I was chanting, Om Guru, Om Guru, Om Guru, Om Guru, Om Guru, mentally. And I would do that for 30 seconds, and then I would go about my work, and then after, Another hour or two, I would go back and reconnect again. We can all do that. But it's a habit that we have to create. We have to make that habit. I re remember one time in the very early years when I was working in our printing department, and I was running this little platen press, and I was printing envelopes. And once I'd get the feeder set up and everything good, I used to just have to pull out one every occasion and look at it and then put it back, make sure everything was right. And it was a very, very hot day. And we had no air conditioning in our print shop at that time. And there were no screens and every door was open to get every little breeze you could, but that also let in all the flies. And the flies, because it was so humid and hot, you were sweating, they of course were attacking you particularly the face or wherever there was sweat. You know, how they get their little itchy scratchies. And so they were bugging me. So we, we had a ruler there that was a, we used in printing. It was a, about a foot long and about an inch wide and a three second of an inch thing. It was made of stainless steel. And so it was very flexible and very strong. <laughs> so a thought dawned in me, you know, I can bend that thing back and I can line up with a fly and when I let go, if my aim is good, he's going to be history. <laughs> so I started to see how this improvised fly swatter would work. And it worked pretty well. And after I had swatted a couple, I heard this voice behind me say, don't you have anything better to do than that? <laughs> And I turned around to see our dear brother Bhaktananda, <laughs> who was my counselor departing from the scene. He didn't wait around to hear my excuses or my attempts to justify my behavior. He just let me know I was off base and left. <laughs> you know, Bhaktananda, he was a great practice of the presence of God. And what was I doing? I was practicing the presence of the flies. <laughs> so, how often do we all do that? And instead of having God in our mind or some spiritual thought in our mind, we're caught in some very mundane thing. And we don't have to be doing that. All it requires is shifting our attention. Diamond wrote, 
Master said a common cause of spiritual discouragement is the devotee's expectation that God's response will come in a great blaze of awe-inspiring inner illumination. This erroneous notion dulls the devotee's perception of the subtle divine responses that are present from the very beginning of one's meditative practices. God responds to the devotee's every effort, every devotional call. Even as a novice, you will realize this in your own seeking if you learn to recognize him as the quiet inner peace that steals over your consciousness. This peace is the first proof of God's presence within. You will know it is he who has guided and inspired you to some right decision in your life. You will feel his strength empowering you to overcome bad habits and nurture spiritual qualities. You will know him as the ever-increasing joy and love that surges deep within, overflowing into your everyday life and relationships. I pray you may more and more feel his nearness and see him in all the circumstances in your life, and that through meditation and loving him, you may merge your heart and soul in his omnipresence. And then Gurji said one time, through the centuries I had been seeking God, and still he did not answer me. But I said, Lord, someday you will come. I don't care how long I have to wait. I knew that through every noble desire, every good thing I had done, he was with me, and still I was calling him though he was so near. So what Guruji is pointing out to us, we have a tendency to put God far away instead of to realize he's right with us. He's not far away. He's right within. Christ said the kingdom of God is within. God is right with us but we have to increase our knowing. As long as we are caught in delusion, we aren't aware of that. So when we are making a loving demand to God, as Master taught, and particularly after you have meditated and practiced your techniques in Kriya, then pray lovingly, Lord, reveal thyself, reveal thyself. Reveal thyself. Just such a simple prayer as that. But it can't be mechanical. In your spiritual efforts, don't allow them to become mechanical. We want to routinize our life, but not our spiritual efforts. Because if they become too habitual, too routinized, the fire goes out, the flame goes out. And that needs to be awakened so that that call attracts the divine response. If there's someone there I want to talk to and I'm saying, well, hi, Joe, you know, how are you and everything, and I'm looking all around and I'm talking to him, nice to see you, you know, and everything. Now, is he going to think I'm really interested in connecting with him? No. Same way when we're trying to connect with God, when we're trying to pray deeply to God, if our prayers are scattered, if our thoughts are scattered, if it just comes from the surface, do we expect a response? God will say, you don't really mean it. You have to make it a, a yearning, a call of the heart, of the soul, of the mind, of every bit of one's being. Come, come, come. You must come. It can be a loving demand. Come, 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 come to me. Come to me. Come, come, come. And hey, if the tears come, that's okay too. Tears wash away the mud of delusion. Cry for God, if necessary. Cry for God, long for God. If we want God's response, we have to show him we mean business. Otherwise, he thinks we are just going along and he will treat us the same way. Now, when I first came on this path, 
I had many outer spiritual blessings, and it was probably because God took a look at this skeptical engineer and said, well, I'm going to have to really show him it works because otherwise he'll be history, you know. He set the hook deep right from the beginning, and boy, he did. And so I had that expectation that that was the way meditation worked. These results were always there. These beautiful experiences were always there. Then after two years when I entered the ashram, it was just as if someone took a scissor and cut it off and said, you don't need that anymore. They were gone. And then basically God tells us at that time, all right, my child, I've shown you it works. Now get busy and earn it. Earning it is quite a bit different from just getting it free. <laughs> and so I was struggling on the spiritual path, learning, you know, the whole life was new, being a monk and learning how to be a monk and what was involved in that and doing my duties and so forth. And there reached a point that I was had one of these dry spells, which all devotees will have at times. This complete dry spell just came over me, and it went on and on and on. Finally, after about a year and a half, I began to become somewhat discouraged. So I went to my counselor, Brother Nanamoy, and, and said, what the heck is going on? I said, it's all work. I said, I get up in the morning, I meditate, work. Go up to my job, more work. Take the break at noon, come back to meditate, more work. Go back in the afternoon, do my work, more work. Come back to meditate, more work. It's all work. <laughs> Nothing's happening. Well, those of you who know Brother Anandamoyji, you will know that he doesn't sugarcoat his pills. <laughs> so he just looked at me and he said, well, what are you meditating for? Are you meditating for God or the consolations of God? And I thought to myself, oh. Oh, because I realized that was exactly the trap I'd fallen into. Because of those previous experiences, I thought that was what was supposed to happen. So I was expecting that, and it wasn't occurring. So I thought the program wasn't working. But that wasn't true. So I went back to my meditation that night, and, and I had a very good heart-to-heart -heart talk with God. And I said, I realize my mistake. I'm sorry, I've been trying to bargain with you like a shopkeeper, saying I've done so many Kriyas, so you have to show up. I see that doesn't work. So I'm not going to try to tell you your job. My job is to meditate. What you want to have come to me because of that, that's your job. If you send me pain, if you send me misery, if you send me nothing at all, fine, so be it. That's your job. And hey, if you send me some bliss, that'd be kind of nice too. I <laughs> won't turn that down. But whatever you send, fine, I accept that. My job is to make the effort. Whatever you send, my job is to receive it with love. Now, my life didn't change right away. In fact, it was, I think, Three or four months later, finally in meditation, one evening, I felt a little peace again stealing over myself. Oh man, that feels so good, you know, <laughs> just to have a little peace. If it's been a long time without any peace, then it's kind of nice when you get some. Well, that was an early one. And uh, later on, after I'd been in the ashram, probably about 12 years, I entered a dry spell, and that went on for five and a half years. And that's kind of interesting when it goes on that long, you know. It, you begin to wonder, what am I doing wrong? What's going on here? And I felt I'm, I'm stuck. I'm on a plateau. I'm not going anywhere. And there were times when I even felt I was going backwards. If you get on a real long dry spell, that may happen. You may think you're actually regressing, but you're not. As long as you're continuing to make effort, whether you are noticing any result or not, you are progressing. But sometimes the spiritual progress is so slow that we don't see the tiny increments that are happening every day. So this went on for five and a half years, and I just kept 
doing the best I could, and sometimes that best wasn't very good, but I kept doing what I could. And then it was most interesting. I said I felt as if I was on a plateau, and suddenly from one moment to the next, I felt my consciousness just change. Just like that. No time, just change. And I realized I was not the same person anymore. Diamataji said, as we grow in understanding and in our love for God, we hasten the development of those around us, children, wife, husband. However, it is not necessarily by our words that we can best influence others. Very often we try to convert family members. It causes much misunderstanding. If someone in your family is not following your spiritual path, it is wrong to try and pressure that individual into accepting your beliefs. Each person must unfold as each flower in his or her own time. You cannot force a seed to become a flower in one day. And so the search for God is an individual pursuit and doesn't mean that we have to hide in the closets to meditate, but we should follow our spiritual effort without trying to make any family members feel that by them not doing it, somehow they are not doing what they should be doing. It shouldn't make them feel uncomfortable. The best way is to change ourselves. That's the best way. There were these two ladies, and they lived in the same city about a block from each other. They knew each other. Their boys played together. And both of them were members and were meditating, the only ones in their family who were meditating, but they weren't saying anything to anyone else. They were just doing their effort. And then they showed up here together at the convocation, and they met, and he said, what are you doing here? <laughs> they had no idea that the other one was a member. And once they got talking together, the first thing that came up in their minds was, well, now what can we do to get our husbands involved in this? But of course, the best thing you can do, you want, want to change someone else? Change yourself. It's the best way to do it. On the other hand, we never know when God will intervene and change someone. There was this one family, the husband and wife, devotees, and one of the grandmothers was very much opposed to what they were doing and thought that they were involved in some terrible thing. And they had several teenage boys, and they were leaving the boys with the grandmother when they came here. She would usually tell the boys, oh, don't, don't meditate, don't do things like that, you shouldn't do that. And so they called up wondering how everything was because they knew her feelings. And the grandmother said to them, I've been in your secret room. That was their meditation room. And I was looking at those pictures and I started to read that little blue book. And something happened to me. I don't know what it is, but something happened to me. And I think now I'm going to read that great big orange book. They're wondering what that next phone call is going to be like. <laughs> so we never know when God will intervene and help someone to come to greater understanding. We never perhaps realize to what an extent changing our life by practicing these teachings changes the lives of those around us. When I first got started on this path, I had a friend at work. And about six months after I was taking the lessons, he asked me one day, he said, hey, those lessons you're taking, what do I have to do to get those lessons? And so I asked him, well, why do you want to know? And he said, anything that can change you that much in six months, I have to find out about. Well, he started taking the lessons and it changed him too. He's Brother Dharmananda. <laughs> For many years, I never asked him 
what change did you notice? I never thought to do that. And finally, a few years ago, I thought, my gosh, I never asked him what change he saw. And so I said, Dharma Nanaji, you know, I never asked you, what change did you see that impelled you to ask about the lessons? And he sort of smiled a little bit. He said, well, he said, I saw you weren't so arrogant anymore. <laughs> And you were starting to learn to think of others and to not just think of yourself. So that's what these teachings can do for us. Now, the more that we can deepen the personal relationship with the guru, the more one will find that one's life changes. This is a very important part on the spiritual path, which I think we sometimes neglect to emphasize. I know myself, uh, for years, I did not realize the, the depth of the necessity of making that connection deeper and deeper and more and more personal. Because I thought, well, I've come into the ashram, I've dedicated my life to service, of his organization, to following his teachings, what more can I do? But then I realized, oh, there is more that I can do. I have missed something here. I have not really made an effort to make it much more deeper in a personal sense. We need to, as it were, invite God in. Invite God in. He doesn't knock the door down. We need to invite him in. We need to share our lives with him, as we said earlier in the beginning. We need to share our everyday life with him. Make him a part of that life. When I go to give a talk and start out by going to the altar and pranaming, I always talk and pray to Guru. And I say to him very simply, Guruji, I have nothing I can give to these people but you have everything. Let your love, your wisdom, your peace, your joy flow through me. I'm your instrument. Use this instrument. And so he can come in to the lives of each one of us in an ever greater and deeper way. There's that very interesting saying in the Bible and you often see it expressed in the picture, showing Christ knocking at a door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. Now that's a very interesting saying. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. This is the door right here. It has many names in the very scriptures of the world the gate, the gate that looketh toward the east, the eastern star, the spiritual eye, Shiva's eye, center of Christ consciousness, many names, but this is the door. And there is there that peculiar rumbling sound of that great om or amen vibration that is sustaining the whole creation that has a particular knocking or rumbling sound and which is permeated with the Christ consciousness, which is guiding that vibration, that mother aspect of God. Behold, I stand at the door of your consciousness and knock. If any man hear my voice, in other words, anyone becomes aware of that, and open the door, so there's something we have to do. We have to open the door. It's not going to break the door down. We have to open the door and invite him to come in. Hear my voice and open the door. How do we open the door? Strangely enough, we don't open the door by techniques of meditation. We open the door by devotion. The techniques of meditation will take us right up to that door. But to open that door requires devotion. It requires surrender. And that is hard often for us to do, to surrender. You have to surrender that ego if you want that door to open. 
and open the door. But if we do that, what happens? I will come in with him and sup with him and he with me. When we sup with each other, we partake of the same food, of the same nourishment. If we partake of the same thing with the divine, we partake of the same experience, the same consciousness. In other words, one's consciousness will be elevated, spiritualized. And that is what we are all looking for. That is what we are all seeking. That is what we all want, whether we consciously know it or not, or perhaps just occasionally realize that is what we want because we get distracted by all this fluctuating things in the world. But that is what we are seeking. That is what we want. So that is something we can all do. Well, one other thing. The whole magic of success in any endeavor, spiritual or otherwise, is perseverance. And that is why I took that motto that I have used in my spiritual life, keep on keeping on. When I came into the ashram, I promised Gurji one thing. I said, Gurji, I promise you one thing, I will never give up. I don't care. It doesn't matter how many times you fall flat on your face in one sense. Why to lay there in the ground and worship your mistake? <laughs> Get up and move on. Because I've seen sometimes that this is a thing that people do. They make a mistake and they worship it. In other words, they use it as an excuse not to do anything anymore. So they stick it up in the altar and, <laughs> and then occasionally they take it down and beat themselves up with it and put it back up and <laughs> bow to it again. You don't do that. If you've made a mistake, apologize for it, ask forgiveness, and move on. Forget it. Move on. Change. That's what we need to do now. There was one time when I was struggling with something. I've been struggling with it for years, and I couldn't seem to overcome it. And so I finally wrote a note to my counselor, Sri Diamataji and explain to her, you know, I've been working on this, and I, I get somewhere, but I, I just can't, I lose it again. I mean, I've, I can't do it. I give up. I can't make it. So I'm just, I told her, I'm giving it all to Divine Mother, and she's going to have to save me because I can't do it. I never got an answer back so fast in all my life. <laughs> it was in the mail the very next day. And what did she say? The gist of it was very simple. Get in there and fight. In other words, make that effort. Keep on making that effort. You can't run away. If you want to succeed, you have to persevere. Get back in there and continue to make the effort. And then it works. Sooner or later, if we refuse to give up, Sooner or later, we have to succeed. It's simple. You have to. If you refuse to give up, no matter how many times you fail, you come back and you try again. And if you fail, you try again. And if you fail, you try again. Sooner or later, we succeed. And we can all do that. And so in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, fight the battle of life or you will acquire sin. Meaning what? If we refuse to fight the battle of life, we remain caught in delusion. So as you go back to your homes, make the effort. Even if it's just that five minutes a day we talked about, make the effort. Make the effort. Keep trying. Well, I'll tell you one little more story. I'm telling you this just to show that we are capable often of accomplishing more with the blessings of the Guru and the grace of God than we realize. Before I came into the ashram, I went through a period where I became very disillusioned with life because I was not getting the happiness I wanted out of life to the point where I said, well, I'm not going to commit suicide, but I now know why people do. So gradually as I kept meditating, this 
got less and less farther and farther apart and didn't last as long, but this wasn't completely gone. After I'd been in the ashram for several years, I came down with one of these terrible depressing moods. And it was with me for three days and I was walking around the print shop where I was working, spreading gloom everywhere I went. <laughs> and I walked from one side of the print shop to the other to get something, I no longer remember what, and as I did, I walked by Brother Dharmananda. As I said, he'd been friends before. And he knew what I was struggling with because he'd seen my struggles in this area for some time. So as I walked by him, he looked up from his work with a big smile on his face and said, hello, smiley. <laughs> I was furious. <laughs> I thought, how dare he call me smiley? <laughs> he knows I'm not smiling. <laughs> But you know, a very interesting thing happened because of that. After walking several paces beyond him, I stopped and I thought, no, wait a minute. He's your friend. He's not trying to hurt you, he's trying to help you. And for the first time in my life, I asked myself a rather obvious question. Why am I in this terrible mood? And the answer that came back was very interesting. Because you like it. I like it? I enjoy being miserable? The answer that came back, you must, you've been holding on to it very tightly for three days now. Now that was a revelation, and somehow intuitively I knew what to do. And I just looked here at the spiritual eye, and with every ounce of energy and will I had, I mentally shouted, get out, get out, and never come back. And that mood was instantly gone, and I've never had another one. Now, Gurdji showed one thing there very strongly. He had often said, you can change a habit pattern in an instant. But to do so, I realize, requires all that willpower and all that desire. Sometimes the will is there, but the desire isn't really all there. We may be clinging on to it for some crazy reason, even as I was clinging on to those moods. We maybe don't really want to give it up. Now, I have to admit in all truthfulness, I've only been able to do this maybe three or four more times where I could change a pattern like that with just one effort. Usually it takes a long time. But we can change it. We have the power to change it. So let us just close with this thought. As we said earlier, each one of us is a child of God, has within us the strength and the power and the understanding to succeed in life to succeed in our divine quest to know God. God is not hiding from us. We are hiding from Him. When we can realize that it is we who are hiding from Him and see the many ways in which we hide every day, which we hide, which we slip away, in which we ignore him, in which we pay no attention. We perhaps should ask ourselves that question, why? Why do I do this? And then if we are very honest with ourselves and see whatever answer comes and accept that answer, which shows us what we need to do to overcome, then we have had a blessing. We have received an opportunity to overcome something which is holding us back. We're all still caught to a certain degree or other in delusion because we're still here. We're not free yet. But we're on the path to freedom. And this is something I hope each one of you will remember that Gurji said, you do not get a great technique like Kriya Yoga at the beginning of your spiritual search for God. You get it at the end of your spiritual search. 
So when we get a technique, a highly advanced technique like Kriya Yoga, Divine Mother in essence is saying to us, all right, my child, you played around long enough in my delusion, now come home, here's how. We don't want to be like the child that goes off to the movies and sees the movie and then stays and sees it over again and then stays and sees it over again until the mother finally has to come and drag him home. Time has to come when we go home and leave the movie. And will that be miserable? No, that will be joyous. That will be Blissful, look at the lives of the great ones. Though they may have to go through many tests and other things, within that, behind that, was joy. I protest by the rejoicing which I have in Christ. I die daily, St. Paul said. Let us do the same. Let us meditate so that we die daily. Become oblivious to delusion so that we go back home. God bless you all.